Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. All right. Welcome back to Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas. It is day three of Autodesk University. The expo is closing soon. The sound of God may interrupt us here in a moment. We will power through that because we are having fun. And even though my voice sounds like I drank a glass of gasoline, I am feeling good and I am fired up. I'm joined today by Mike Milligan, the Chief Growth Officer from GCPay. Today, we're going to be talking a bit about modernizing payment systems for today's general contractors and a whole lot more about the structure of, you know, how we're paying our teams across the entire AAC ecosystem. So, Mike, how are you feeling today? You fired up? Yeah, it's uh, been a great three days and um, I'm... uh... I'm looking forward to getting some sleep tonight because I haven't had a lot of sleep here this week. So, you know, I empathize with you on that one. I have been getting sleep because every time we wrap up here, I just go straight back to my hotel Good after, for you. you know, running through a gamut of interviews. But the, uh, it's a real privilege to be here doing this and talking to folks like yourself. So I appreciate you joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, let's, uh, let's jump straight into the, uh, the joys of uh, payment structures. Can you tell me a little bit about what the typical structure looks like that you're seeing for most contractors. I'd love to hear just the lay of the land as far as, you know, the typical payment approach we're seeing. I think everybody knows that the construction industry is probably one of the last bastions of technology adoption, um, not just in North America, but around the world. Um, So it is shocking every day to see that when commercial construction companies are dealing with their subcontractors and paying subcontractors, they're literally still writing physical checks. Um, And so um, there's a lot of checks to be written. That's a lot of paper, but more (laughs) importantly, it's a lot of manual workflow that represents not just a lot of time, but a lot of potential human error as well. Whether you're a large commercial construction company or, you know, a medium-sized commercial construction company, if you're managing 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 jobs a month, chances are you've got hundreds, if not thousands of subcontractors working for you over a period of years. And they've got to be paid at certain increments in time uh, based on, you know, schedules of billing uh, timelines. And so that's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of manual processing, a lot of time, and a lot of potential human error. You know, I, I appreciate that baseline, and you've you've really covered it very clearly. And it just makes me think. And this is a this is a terrible analogy, but you know, you're in the grocery line, and you're ready to go. You're in a hurry. You're going somewhere, and then Grandma pulls out her checkbook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, oh no. Yeah. You sit there and, and you know patiently wait for them to fill out that check. And it's always perplexing on even such a small scale of why are you using paper checks instead of a debit card that achieves the same thing yeah. and offers you more protections in your payments and all these other things that come with a little bit more of a modern approach. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's a bigger scale, but a very similar problem that we're talking about. And, you know, my mom still balances her checkbook, checkbook. I don't think I ever have right. <laughs> in yeah. my entire life. That's yeah. not, it's not even a thing that comes up as far as yeah. part of the conversation. Yeah. And so I think, uh, I think there's a lot of room to make some improvements. So I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing a bit more about that. So how does this change between geos and regions? So, of course, we're in the United States right now, but is this a, a similar challenge outside of North America or it is. is it different? Yeah, it is. I mean, North America, the U.S. Uh, specifically, has certain requirements um, associated with paying subcontractors in a timely manner. There are these documents called lien waivers. And a lot of people don't know what lien waivers are unless you are dealing with them day in and day out. Okay, other countries don't have those types of lien waiver documents simply because government legislations do that work for the general contractor. But here in the United States, lien waivers are very much 
part and parcel to subcontractors getting paid on time for work that they're doing. I think I read something a couple of years ago that an average invoice sent from a subcontractor to a general contractor for services that they have provided and payment that needs to be paid for those services requires like eight to 10 emails back and forth between the GC accounting department and the subcontractor to get those lien waivers completed, documented, signed off on before those payments can be made. So the biggest issue today is what you would call timely payment or prompt payment. And in other countries, particularly the UK, although we're starting to see this in Canada as well, government legislation is starting to pass what we call prompt payment legislation. And what that basically says is if you're a GC and you've got subcontractors who are working for you, and if you don't pay them on time as per their contract, you're in deep trouble. You're going to get fined. Okay. We're starting to see that trickle into the United States. Um, it's already in a couple of provinces in Canada, but we're starting to see this trickle into the United States. Illinois is looking at it. California is looking at it. And so if you're, if you're not paying your supply chain on time and managing all of the documentation, the compliance documentation, the lien waiver documentation in order to get those subs paid in a timely manner, you're you're not just going to get fined. You're actually going to get left behind because those subs are going to go to work for another GC. Oh, absolutely. Right. Like I couldn't imagine if if my payments is just an individual were delayed and required all of this back and forth. Yeah. I would be so upset and I'm not fronting the cost for things like materials and all of the, the things that come with being a specialty contractor. Right. And it's really unfortunate. And I'm, I've, I've spoken at length with others about the, the punitive nature of our current delivery methods and our contracts and yeah. how that risk rolls downhill. And it sounds like from what you're sharing is that really does roll fully into the, the realm of finance. And yeah. honestly, if you just step back, that's not very fair. That, no. that's, that's a real challenge. No. And I, I empathize with somebody who's in that position and it, it might frustrate, frustrate some of these GCs who are listening to me right now say this, but like pay your subs on time. And I think the legislation makes sense if, uh, if you're, you know, notoriously behind schedule on this, this is, you know, somebody's business could go under because they're having to foot the bill of so many materials. Yeah, that's right. Fair. that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. So can you tell me a little bit more about the broader gaps that we're seeing in these payment systems and why is there hesitancy to digitize? Like, why are we still seeing paper checks? Why, why on earth? Because, I mean, obviously, it's easy for me to say, I don't want to use my checkbook anymore, my debit card. I'm just a guy. But, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's more nuanced, I know, with the industry. I think there are two sort of factors. Number one, um, technology adoption in what you would call the quote unquote back office in the finance department. Technology adoption there is not seen as an investment, it's seen as, a, as an expense. When companies are looking at adopting technology, well, of course they want to get the cool stuff. You know, they wanna get the field-based project management, they wanna get the BIM, you know, technology um, over here, you know, in the, in, the, in the expo center here. When it comes to finance and accounting and payment technology, it's sort of like, yeah, we don't need that because we've got human capital in order to deal with that, you know, with those types of workflows, with those types of processes. OK, so it's like I said, it's seen as an expense instead of an investment. That's one factor. The other factor is this crazy, outdated mentality that exists between the GC and the sub where the GC says, I'm going to write a check and I'm going to leave it at my front receptionist desk. And I'm going to call the subcontractor and tell him or her that he can, he or she can come pick up their check, but they've got to bring their lien waiver in, in at their signed lien waiver in, in order to get that check in their physical hands. So you've got this, you know, sort of, hey, I, I, I'll trade you my card for your card, you know, kind of phenomenon that is just, like I said, crazy and outdated, but very much real because the GC doesn't want to pay the sub until the sub has met all of his or her requirements in terms of documentation and lien waiver, uh, lien waiver forms. 
And also they want to double check to make sure that that work has been performed and that that invoice is correct so that they're not over billing against what they've promised to be billing. That's why you have this sort of face-to-face interchange and sort of card trading trick that sort of happens, you know, oftentimes in the front office, this, the receptionist desks at, you know, in these general contractors home offices, right? So that's, a, that's another, you know, sort of dimension to it as well. Even though technology solves it, many, if not all of those issues, it goes back to, well, we've got this process down, this workflow works for us. Yeah, we've had a couple of human errors here and there, but this is why we have a staff. This is what they do. And if we are going to invest more in technology, well, we kind of don't need it. That's sort of the mentality um, that is changing. That is changing, you know, rapidly as, as the workforce becomes younger in construction, but it's still very much pervasive. Well, I, I appreciate that high level overview. And, and I think just coming back to your earlier point of the, the opportunity for human error, like with, with such a, a big financial you know, output and some of these checks are going to be tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of yep. dollars, depending on the scope of work you're doing. Yep. It just seems outrageous to not lean on more digitized versions of this process to, to yeah. move this narrative forward. But it also, it's it's just not very equitable. It's, it's not fair. And, no, and I, it's not. And, and, you know, we like to say that we're sort of the, the last two yards of the football field you know, before you're going to go in to score. The, the payment at the very end of the process of that construction project, you know, that's sort of like the last two yards. And your, your goal is to try to convert those two yards into a score as quickly as you possibly can. Because to your point, it's what's fair and equitable to both parties. But that's, you know, that is where technology will completely change the landscape of, that back office finance department and the payment processes that, for the most part, are very manual today. And, and that actually tees up my next question very nicely. So w- what is the alternative? What, where is this ideal state? And what exists right now where if you know, somebody does want to take a more equitable approach to this, like where do they start? How do we fix this? Believe it or not, many, many finance departments in general contractors, companies are using Excel right? They're using an accounting system. They may be having, you know, they may be using a construction ERP, um, you know, type of an accounting system, but they're using Excel. And so not only is that creating more and more of these manual processes and potentially human error, but it also problem called double entry accounting. And double entry accounting, as anybody knows who has been an accountant, takes forever because you're entering in, you know, finance information over here, maybe in an Excel spreadsheet, and then you've got to enter it into your ERP. The way to fix that, or the way to improve that workflow is to look at automated subcontractor payment mechanisms. And obviously that's what my company does, and that's what we feel we're so good at, because what it does is it eliminates all of those manual processes and it eliminates double entry accounting, and it eliminates human, human error. And so I think as, as more and more finance departments and more and more controllers and CFOs begin to see the value of digitizing the whole payment, that back office payment management uh, process, you're going to see more and more digital solutions not only co- be, be acquired, um, but more and more are going to be invented over the next several years. It, it makes sense. And, you know, I, I have to chuckle a little bit because we spend so much time on the construction side eliminating this double entry that you're talking about right now. Yeah. And it seems astonishing that we would just lean back and go, that's okay in finance, especially tied to the, you know, the financial well-being of the business. Yeah. And I think there's, there's a mindset shift that we have to have and I, I did like your point earlier about, you know, the younger generations are starting to take the realm or the helm in some of these organizations. And I feel that equity conversation is starting to become a bit more meaningful and more common. And I, I'm hopeful that that does extend to, you know, contractor payments because yeah. this is a relationships-based industry. And if you are 
arbitrarily or deliberately or unintentionally being punitive to your subcontractors or the people that you're working with, even if it's that, you know, that lean waiver exchange that you're talking about, like, right. it just feels like an unnecessary song and dance if there are mechanisms to ensure that, you know, the contractors and subcontractors, everybody's made whole. Like, yeah. that should be the fairness part of it, too, as far right. as helping make sure that you get paid for the work you did and not using some weird trick of accounting to try to sidestep that. And yep. I know not everybody does that, but there are times where there are examples. contentious is where they go, well, yeah. you didn't document that right, so I guess it didn't happen. That's right. And that's too bad. And, yeah. and I don't want to poke my finger in anybody's eye. I recognize that this is a very nuanced and, and complex process. But I do still think that you know equity extends well beyond just payment terms and just the broader subcontractor, general contractor relationship right. and the contracts we use. Yeah, because look, the, the, the subs that are going to get paid on time correctly for the work that they have done on behalf of the general contractor, those subs want to work for those GCs. Absolutely. And the GCs who are lackadaisical and are paying their subs late or who are paying their subs incorrectly as a result of human error or whatever, those subs aren't going to want to work for you long term. They're going to go find those fair and equitable GCs who are going to treat them the way that they want to be treated and need to be treated in a respectful way and in a fair and equitable way, as you said. I just think of an example. I'm, I'm not going to name any names or any regions or anything in this one, but I know of a, a notorious owner that a uh, contractor I know of that was, we'll just say, pain in the butt. They, okay. were, they were a challenging owner to work for, yeah. and they were building a lot of stuff that very visible and very high scale. And from what I was told, there was the market price for this work. And then there was the price that all of these subcontractors and GCs in the area applied for that particular owner because yeah. they said, if you want us to work for you, it costs 30 or 30% more because we know we're going to deal with so much BS. Yeah. And I use that yeah. example because even though construction is one of the biggest industries in the entire world, it's still also a small industry in the it sense is. that people know each other, people know and build those relationships and people talk. And if you treat people poorly like that, that gets around. And so you might experience the bad behavior price or the I don't really want to work for you price or the right. I'm not going to work for you price. So here's the 70 hundred billion percentile inflated number yeah. Yeah, that nobody's ever going to take because they don't want that work, you know? I mean, listen, there. Labor shortage is one of the biggest challenges facing the construction industry right now today. GCs are finding extremely challenging uh, situations finding labor, whether it's job site labor, subcontractor labor, reliable labor in every, you know, sort of along every step in the in the supply chain. And if your payment methodology and your payment processes are not fair and equitable, that just adds to the labor shortage and adds to the labor challenges that everybody is facing. And projects are already slower to get started today as a result of macroeconomic conditions that maybe you and I can't control. And their schedules are shorter and, than and ever there's, happened. That's right. And their schedules are shorter than ever. And their margins are even more razor thin today. So you are seeing some of that markup um, when you know that you've got supply chains dealing with, whether it's an owner or whether it's a GC who is a pain in the butt to deal with, right? And so that just goes back to why you need to have efficient processes and efficient processes, not just in pre-construction, in bidding, in project management, all the way down to that last two yards um, with payment processes. Yeah. And it's, it, it sounds like it'd help you wrap your project up faster as well and get your people onto the next project. That's if right. You're not doing this weird little dance to you know get all the payment. Terms, chasing which, lien waivers which, and yeah. yeah, chasing incorrect invoices. That's right. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Send your people to the next project. You don't have to waste your time on this. Yeah. So what guidance would you offer a contractor out there listening who... Their interest is peaked. They go, okay, like I, I'd like to start making progress and you know making some changes. Like where do they start? Because yeah. especially if they're a larger contractor, this could feel a little bit overwhelming because they have a yeah. process, they have some people that have been doing it a certain way for a very long time. 
Like, how do you shift that mindset and start making moves toward a more digital approach? I think what I would do is, um, number one, I would talk to some of my peers. Okay. Some of my peers who have adopted digital payment mechanisms, um, software, um, you know, solutions to, to help digitize this and help automate it to create that efficiency. I would start there. The next thing I would do is uh, I would just do my homework, you know, go to Captera, you know, go to G2, look at software reviews by real users, right? Don't just take it from, you know, somebody like me, um, you know, go, <laughs> I go. seem credible. Yeah, I, mean, a, <laughs> I, I think I am, but go do your homework, right? Um, you know, do some Googling, look at who the, who the vendors are out there that really specialize um, in automated subcontractor management and payment management. You made a point a second ago, and I think you're spot on, Eric, the, the industry is very small. It's also very viral. I have found in you know, 12, 13 years of working in this industry that it is a very tribal industry. Word of mouth goes not just a long way, but almost all the way. That's what I would do. That's kind of the way where I would start. And once you kind of sort of narrow down two, three, four, you know, software providers that you want to learn more about, then go check out their websites. Most of their websites, like ours, have customer testimonials, you know, have customer reviews on there, have case studies, um, you know, have mechanisms that you can sort of self-direct your journey to learning more about, you know, software solutions and technology as a whole that can help you manage payments, you know, you know, just in a more efficient way. I think that's what I would do. I like that. It is a great approach to, to any technology you're considering to purchase as well. Yeah. You know, you don't want to just go to one and go, okay, this feels good. Even if you're really bought into that tool, it's, it's always prudent to do your due diligence and just see, you know, maybe there's a way to save a bit more money and achieve the same outcome. Or maybe there's a tool that has a feature set that's going to even up-level what you're trying to do because you didn't know about those features. Because yeah. you yeah. don't know what you don't know. That's right. And there's there's a lot of, hap- a lot of things happening in our industry, you know, regardless of if you're talking about payment terms or pre-construction. Right, so, right. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Well, yeah. Mike, I've got one final question for you today. And uh, it's, what's one tool that you'll always use on every project that you work on? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, listening and learning. I mean, I think, you know, I'm sort of a student of life, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, so just listening to people, uh, talking to you, you know, uh, learning about different technology, learning about, you know, different businesses, learning about different industries and how different industries, what they have learned over the years and how that can apply to this industry. So, um, yeah, I would say listening and learning, reading, all of that, you know, um, is, is probably something that carries with me every single, every single job, every single project, every single initiative that I work on. That's that a uh, astute observation for where we're at right now as well, as far as being at Autodesk University. True. It's amazing convergence <laughs> of all these different industries. There's a lot and, of listening yeah, and learning. <laughs> a lot of people to learn from. So, yeah. you know, if you're out there listening today, make sure uh, you check out Autodesk University in the future too, because there's, there's a whole lot more that you can learn. But Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise and perspective with uh, our listeners. And for everybody out there listening today, of course, this is Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas. I bet you're probably tired of me announcing this over and over again across the entire expo, but I have had an absolute blast this week. And uh, if you haven't noticed, we are a video first podcast. I am surrounded by cameras. It's an absolute blast. So make sure you head over to the Autodesk Construction Cloud website and check out our backlog of episodes. We're also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you go get your podcasts. Finally, if you want to you know, chase me around on the internet, ask me a question, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Eric Thomas at Autodesk or on Twitter at builder underscore digital. And without final ado, goodbye. <laughs>